Good morning. We had a wonderful day, wonderful conference. Thanks to all of you. And now we are back with an amazing panel this morning with none other than Jennifer Reynolds starting us as the moderator. Good morning. Um, uh, thank you so much. My name is Jennifer Reynolds, and I am from the University of Oregon School of Law. Okay. I'm very happy to be here. It's been a wonderful conference so far. Many thanks to Nancy, Tom, Suk, and everybody else who's been involved in putting this conference together. We have a terrific panel for you this morning. Um, let me briefly introduce our panelists, and then I will talk for a minute about the plan. So these introductions are going to be brief. As Noam said yesterday, Google. So uh, uh, we will get right to it. So this is Jill Gross from Pace, Josh Stolberg from The Ohio State University, Kelly Browelson from University of Arkansas Little Rock, and Lisa Kloppenberg from Santa Clara Law. The title of our session this morning is Engaging the Real World, Cohen. Clinics, service, and outreach. It's an hour-long session followed by two breakouts that develop important aspects of the theme of engaging the real world with respect to access to justice and again, clinics, service, and outreach. So engaging the real world is a very expansive topic. For our part, to frame our discussion in this plenary, we will not be addressing the questions of why should we engage the real world? Or what does engagement look like in its many forms? You already know a lot about these questions. Instead, we'd like to focus our time on how do we engage the real world, specifically and operationally, as ADR professors. Some of this engagement is going to happen through clinics, some through service, and some through outreach. And, and note that this perspective on engagement takes as its starting point the academy. Um, each of our panelists is a professor, and so our perspective for this session centers on the ways in which the academy and the real world can interact. But even of those of you who are not working in a law school will hopefully see opportunities from this discussion about possible and fruitful points of engagement. So with this in mind, this morning, each of our professors will take us through one example from his or her experience of real-world engagement, what it is, why they decided to get involved, and how they made it happen, with a focus on nuts and bolts. How do we transform our aspirations into reality? What kinds of obstacles can we expect to encounter? How do we overcome these obstacles? I've asked the panelists to choose just one example from their experience tell us what it is, how they got involved, to talk through how they made it happen, and then to recount how they dealt with only one obstacle to engagement. Now, note that they may have had to do many things to implement their example. They may have had to deal with many different obstacles. But we're limiting this discussion to the implementation highlights and to one obstacle so that we can get into details in our limited time. Our hope is that taking this more focused look at implementation how we make engagement real and effective will provide us with actionable advice and useful takeaways. So we also welcome questions and thoughts from the audience. Our plan is for, now that I'm done talking, each of the panelists is going to talk for about 10 minutes. Um, and then we'll have, hopefully, time to discuss with all of you. All right, so we're going to start with Lisa. Thank you, Jen. I want to second Jen's thanks to all the organizers. This has been a really fun conference, thoughtful, and I've got a number of ideas I'm taking away. So um, we're all grateful. I'm excited to share with you today a project at Santa Clara University where law students and professors teach conflict resolution skills to at-risk high schoolers in a very poor Latinx neighborhood in East San Jose. In California, our population is about 40% Latinx, and it's only going to grow in the coming decades. We work with the Foundation for Hispanic Education, which sponsors three high schools, including the Latino College Preparatory Academy, with which we work, and it sends many students to four-year colleges. Many of the students are immigrants, or their parents are immigrants, and the average family income is $31,000. Well, that might be okay in Dayton, Ohio. It's really tough to live in the Silicon Valley. 
on that income. So Jen asked me to talk about why did I get involved with this. I wrote an essay about justice for all in the Ohio State's <laughs> Journal of Dispute Resolution a few years ago. That's one thing I learned in Ohio. Um, I drew on the excellent Divided Community Project there by Nancy Rogers, Josh, and Grand Lum on getting law students out to work with civil rights and other community issues. I also drew on my work for the Kettering Foundation about the justice gap and the problems in our court system. Nancy Welsh identified this yesterday and it's a major issue for our profession. I urged ADR professors to get out in the community, to get law students working with non-lawyers, especially youth, so that we can learn from community members while building connections for community members to the justice system in our democracy. I believe this is a powerful role for ADR educators, and our law students can be great ambassadors for our profession in dialogue with citizens about the justice system including its barriers, problems, and impact on real world people. After all, we have many first generation law students and they're closer to that world and they can't just leave it behind as they become professionals. The second influence was a program I participated in for Jesuit leadership in higher education where we studied complex global issues of marginalization. As one aspect, we visited Haiti and the Dominican Republic and observed discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity, gender, social strata, language, colonial history, et cetera. And it was all so familiar to me as a Californian who had done my pro bono work with Latin American immigrants and torture survivors. The Jesuit program challenged us to go home and do justice in our own communities using our own expertise. So this project evolved into a course at Santa Clara Law. How did we make it happen? The first year I worked with a colleague, Margaret Russell, a wonderful law professor who teaches restorative justice and also serves as the associate provost for diversity and inclusion at the university. The course has grown to 18 students in two years and so we begin by doing some preparatory sessions with the law students on conflict resolution and the culture we'll be dealing with and teenagers in general um, at campus. And then we go to East San Jose for about eight sessions and we teach the high schoolers about active listening, negotiation, mediation, restorative justice, and the justice system generally. It's changed from a one unit to a two unit course because I realized, of course, I was too ambitious that first year. <laughs> and the students gave me feedback that we really needed to spend more time on negotiation and mediation with the high schoolers. The leaders of these sessions at the high school are, are the law students. So they work in teams and they take on a lesson. And they've been extremely creative in taking some basic lessons and really revising them in a way to make them fun and engaging for the high schoolers. The law students love working with the high schoolers. Many of them have siblings that age and the high schoolers enjoy them. And then, so I really hope that there's some bonding, ability to dialogue, some role model work going on there. Then we also bring in accomplished Latinx professional role models judges, lawyers, business leaders each week to share their deeply personal stories of overcoming hardship. The law students do three reflective essays over the course of the semester. I've really been shocked by how thoughtful they are. We've also arranged field trips for the high schoolers to visit our campus and interact with our young Latino La Raza students as well as recent grads. So Jen asked me to speak to one obstacle it may sound silly, but the most difficult obstacle has been scheduling. Uh, we've had to adapt to meet the needs of both the high schoolers and the law students. Law schools work on the semester system and you forget how much we're ingrained in those 50 minute blocks or hour and 15 minute blocks. High schoolers have a lot of other pressures in their schedules, including state requirements, AP courses, athletics, etc. This is a volunteer activity for the high school students. So they stay after school to do this. 
We've had to adjust class sessions when certain conflicts occur for high schoolers. We've had to schedule the course so that law students have time to commute to and from the campus in East San Jose and get back for their next class. We've had to communicate carefully, clearly, and frequently with the high school administration about the limits facing our law students and the limits on their students. I think unless we can get this to be a regular part of the high school curriculum, we'll just have to continue to deal with these uh, scheduling issues and be flexible. The high school would love us to create a year-round program, but I've got a couple other things on my plate and I just haven't had the bandwidth for that yet. Um, I think it's a really exciting project and I'm hopeful in a small way we're making a difference for the Latinx population in East San Jose. These students are gonna go and become leaders as well as for our law students. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. You know, a few things that really stand out to me from your from your talk is I really, it's so interesting how you demonstrated the connection between your research and your writing with this engagement. Yeah. That's, that's inspiring because sometimes I think we wonder what our research is for. Yeah. Um, and it's a great example of something I've, I heard about yesterday quite a bit, the active learning that comes from teaching. So the students being involved in teaching classes. I mean, I think a lot of us are thinking about teaching in the law school class, but teaching high schoolers, you know, it's it's great. And I'm glad you mentioned this uh, scheduling problem because I feel like for a lot of us, the trying to figure out how to coordinate, not just the schedules between the law school and the, the high school, but all those visitors too, it's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's an epic amount of work. And when a lot of us are working just um, without any administrative support, managing just that element it's so pedestrian, but it's it's such a yeah. huge obstacle. Yeah. So thank you for that. Okay, so we now turn to Jill. Okay, thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me to be on this panel. Um, it gives me the opportunity to talk about an accomplishment in my career that I'm quite proud of um, and would love to share. Uh, that has to resonate very clearly with, with the theme of the panel. So. For the first 15 years of my academic career, I either taught, co-taught, supervised, directed, whatever title you want to come up with, uh, my law school's uh, securities arbitration clinic, which is now known as the Investor Rights Clinic, in which students represent uh, investors of modest means in very low dollar value customer disputes with their brokerage firms. Um, those disputes, for reasons I can't go into here, necessarily must be resolved in arbitration. Uh, before now it's before uh, FINRA, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority that has a dispute resolution forum. Uh, not we don't, Those disputes don't go to court. Um, through that work, uh, clinic students and the supervisors, me included, learned about flaws in the securities arbitration rules of procedure uh, and other key issues that arose due to the unique nature of the forum for resolution of those disputes. Um, and so I want to talk today about one particular flaw that students and, uh, this, and through the work with the supervisors, uh, a flaw we noticed and a flaw that I decided I wanted to fix. Um, and so I began uh, what I didn't know at the time, but upon reflection was a, uh, is now a crusade to change <laughs> the one piece of the rule of uh, the Code of Arbitration Procedure uh, at FINRA with respect to claims of the smallest dollar value, what is now known as simplified arbitration. Uh, and for since the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, disputes below at first it was 10,000, then they raised the cap to 25, I believe it now it's at 50. Disputes below that dollar amount would be resolved solely on the papers. An arbitrator would look at uh, paper submissions from both sides, make a decision on the papers. The idea was that without uh, the, the time and uh, needed for a hearing session, it would be uh, low cost. Um, but a lot of those disputes were very fact intensive and credibility of the investor versus the broker was the linchpin of the dispute. And so to not have an opportunity to be heard uh, orally at some point during the resolution of the dispute was a problem. It was a problem for procedural justice. It was a problem for perceptions of fairness. It was a problem for actual substantive justice. It was a problem for 
uh, a sense of closure by the client. And so, uh, and, and an empirical study I had done in 2007, eight revealed, wasn't actually a target of the study, but I isolated just the variable for simplified arbitration and found that the investors' perceptions of fairness in the securities arbitration forum were even more negative, as negative as they were for all, all FINRA arbitration, were even more negative for claims under that, that dollar amount. And so I attributed that to the lack of, in part, the lack of procedural justice. So um, I followed, uh, Jen asked us, what did we do? Well, I followed what I now call the crap method of uh, <laughs> my crusade, crap, credibility, Repetition, actual evidence, because crep didn't work, so I use A for actual <laughs> evidence. P, publish, and P, the final P, crap, with double P, patience, which many of you know is not my most, uh, desire, my, my most uh, characteristic flaw. I mean, a character trait. I do not have a lot of patience, but for this I was. So um, I found ways to communicate to the forum uh, that I thought that this sh was a problem. And then after a few years of studying it, I then proposed a solution. Um, I wrote a comment letter to rule proposals in 2007, another one, January 2007, June 2007, October 2008, uh, and spoke about the what the comment letter was about was a particular rule proposal that was not my subject, but I used footnotes to get in there that I thought this particular aspect of the system should change. Um, I wrote a primer for a PLI um, uh, piece, and I had a separate section mentioning this problem. Uh, I then let it stew for a little while, thinking about a solution. This is the P patience part of it. Uh, in 2012, uh, I was on the AALS section of dispute resolution panel, and I, for the first time, talked uh, out loud about my idea of adding a, a hybrid option for resolving these disputes, not purely paper, not purely live hearing, but telephonic in nature, uh, and some version of a shortened hearing. Um, I then published an article, that's the, the, the fourth letter P, published an article, uh, about the problem and my proposed solution, citing actual evidence from my empirical study and from anecdotal conversations with users of the forum. It wasn't quite what one would call qualitative empirical research, but it was close enough. Uh, and then after the publication of the article, um, there was a task force formed by FINRA to address some, uh, all of the flaws in the system, not just the one I had identified. Uh, the task force asked me to uh, submit my um, comments. I submitted my comments in the spring of 2015. Uh, the ABA dispute resolution section joined the comments. Uh, Nancy Welsh was a huge mover in that. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, and that suggestion also came from the ABA section of dispute resolution. In December 2015, the task force recommended that FINRA change the simplified arbitration procedure to include a telephonic option. It never cited me, but hey. <laughs> uh, in uh, January of 2018, things don't move very quickly in the securities industry uh, when it comes to helping investors, but that's just my view. Uh, the FINRA filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission a rule proposal to change the rule of simplified arbitration, rule 12800 and 13800 uh, for industry disputes to allow a telephonic hybrid option for uh, disputes uh, that fall in the simplified arbitration category. That was approved in the summer of 2018 Regulatory Notice 18-21, issued July 23rd, 2018, announced the rule change would be effective September 17th, 2018. As of May 2019, 15 out of 61 eligible cases opted for this, what we now call this special proceeding. Uh, 36 eligible industry cases uh, opted for this special proceeding, which is usually uh, individual brokers who have employment discrimination claims or other employment disputes with their brokerage firms. Um, the option, just to very briefly describe it, I know I'm running out of time, 
Um, it involves, uh, it can be no longer than one full day, two uh, four-hour sessions, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Each side gets two hours to present its side and a half hour for rebuttal and closing. No cross-examination of either side is permitted. Um, there is, uh, as I said, no cross. Um, and uh, each side cannot call the opposing party as its witness, so you can only present your case uh, through live testimony of your own witnesses, plus any paper submissions you'd like to make. Um, the first award came down uh, in, where are we, uh, June, I think it was around February, March. Um, it was not favorable to the customer, but I know I spoke to the lawyer involved and the customer was pleased that he had an opportunity to be heard. Uh, and so we now have an example of how we can actually make a small difference, the crap method. <laughs> um, what obstacle did I face? Well, I, you know, where I'm a law professor, it's about publishing and, and publishing things that are not necessarily about a tiny little rule change. It's about publishing highfalutin articles, and this didn't really fit in. Um, part of it was patience. I wrote other things in between. Uh, and, and still publish this because it was something I felt it was very important and it, was a, it made a difference. Did it get published in you know, a top journal? No, it didn't. Um, I don't care. It's one of the articles I'm most proud of because it actually has now helped uh, almost uh, three dozen, uh, actually four dozen uh, individual people uh, to, to be able to um, be heard. Uh, and so that is what I did, that's how I made it happen. I had a short time, so if anybody really wants to talk about all the nitty gritty details of how I went about this, um, I'm happy to uh, go into it at some free moment that we have in this incredibly busy conference, but thank you. I just think that must have been incredibly exciting. Even though it took a very long time, it's uh, it's Keep thrilling patience. to think that that would happen, and uh, it really underscores the service that professors and students can play um, for the justice system. The service that they can give the justice system, in helping work through the process and identify flaws and make a change. So, thank you. Okay, Kelly, that's a hard act to follow. That's a hard act to follow. Um, I will say I feel a little surrounded by OSU, so I'm just going to say go blue and move on. Um, just had to get that out there. Um, <laughs> but um, I'm going to talk about a very different project than Jill's on a very much more um, local state level that we've done. I'm at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, and uh, about 2007, the Department of Education approached me because federal law for schools requires that Department of Education's offer mediation to their parents that are going through due process in special education. And so they didn't have any programs. We had a program that is the Arkansas Youth Mediation Program where we mediated in dependency and neglect cases, started by John Landy. I was known in Arkansas as the new John Landy for mm -hmm. about eight years. Um, and um, so we, it was an add-on for us to do this with the Department of Ed. It needed to happen, and we were happy to do it. Um, it's important because there's a lot of conflict that go on between teachers and parents and also administrators. Sometimes the administrators are fighting with the teachers and sometimes they're fighting with the parents, but to get them on the same page. And one of the biggest things I think about mediation in these cases as I've done them through the years is, is translation. You know, the acronyms that people use in every industry are especially uh, rampant in teaching and testing for kids. And so to just translate some of that that's going on with parents, um, and sometimes we were fighting, you know, you fight the Google doctor. Um, we were fighting what happened, what parents would go online and say, well, this is, a, my son has this condition, or my daughter has Asperger's, my son has um, something else, and this is what we need, so the school has to come up with the resources for it. And the school would say, no, we don't have to. Um, and that's very simplified. Um, and we had some excellent schools who, you know, a parent wants everything for their child. And we had excellent schools and we had some excellent parents and they usually were not on the same cases because we didn't see those cases, right? So we started this project and it was great and we actually expanded. So we have a project also with um, the younger population with the Department of Human Services from zero to three before they get to school to mediate those cases. And it's a great project and we liked it, but it wasn't, 
being, it wasn't as effective as it could be. And so we started working with CADRE, which is out of Oregon, which is uh, the Consortium for Dispute Resolution and Education, and realizing one of the things that was happening in the country to help with these cases is doing it more at the front end, before the parents and the teachers um, and the administration get so far apart let's facilitate the creation of an IEP. An IEP is an individualized education program or an individualized education plan. Uh, I don't like to say IEP plan because that's the individualized education plan plan, but, <laughs> or program plan. Um, but they're very important and they really set the tone for the child's education. And one of the things that we found is that there could be an IEP, but it was being interpreted very differently by schools and by the parents. And when we could sit down and when we created a program and for some reason, and some of you may have run into this with attorneys, but for teachers and administrators, they saw mediation not as a helpful free tool for them, but as something else they had to do, right? We know that the paperwork attached to, ch to kids and to schools, especially children with special needs, has gone up. They saw mediation as another meeting they had to go to. They saw it as somebody who was saying they weren't doing what they needed to do for the children, and it created sometimes more distance between the parents and the, and the teachers and the administrators. So we started to facilitate the creation of IEPs. Now, Arkansas has very strict mediation laws about confidentiality, and that was something else that we ran into with what could the teachers and the parents take out of mediation when it was a confidential process. So instead of mediation, we went to facilitation. And we're facilitating the creation of IEP, so we're sitting down with parents, with teachers, with administrators at the front end to, set, to identify what the issues are that the student has, to identify what the programs are that the school has that can help the teachers, or uh, sorry, can help both the teachers and the parents, um, and what, the, what setting expectations for exactly what some of the more formal language in an IEP means. So from day one, they're on the same page about whether what downtime means, what specialized help means. We had some parents who really wanted, they thought, because they're entitled under Arkansas law and they were told by a parent advocate, not by a teacher, a parent advocate is someone who comes in and help, they can be very helpful. They also probably have a student with their own special needs whose needs weren't met and so they can get very upset and have their own agendas. And one of the things we found out is that several of our parents really thought they were entitled to an all day aid and that's what they needed when in fact the all day aid, the only requirement to be an aid is to have 30 hours of college credit. You don't have to have any special education training, you don't have to have any education training, you could have been studying engineering for 30 hours and you qualify as an aid. And some of the schools that had really good programs were being stymied by these parents. So when we created this facilitation program, we went out and we did training. We did training for the parents, we did training for the schools, thank you, we did training for the administrators. Um, and sort of realized from our mistakes from the mediation at the back end how much more we could do at the front end to set things up to succeed and to really ask parents what their definition of, of their child's needs were, how they thought their child would, needs would best be met. And one of my favorite parts is to bring in children, bring in the people, not without, um, not about us without, uh, not, sorry, what's the, there's a phrase that the uh, young people use, um, not about me without me, something like that, where we bring them in to talk about what they really need. And some of that was really helpful because what we found, much like I've done in my divorce mediation, is that if the children were telling their parents one story and their teacher another story. And so we got everybody on the same page in the same room for an amount of time and talked about really what would best meet the child's needs and when we're coming back. And we got a lot more buy-in through the facilitations, the initial IEPs, than we did when we were mediating on the back end and there were real problems. And then we started having principals request them as opposed to parents and having teachers say, yes, I wanna participate in this and I wanna help with this. And special education coordinators come and help with this. So that was great and it was a successful program, but one of the issues was is I had a roster of special education mediators. My students would go and observe and sometimes they would get to do the writing and sometimes they would get to be a part of it, but they really weren't paying a large role in these cases. And one of the other problems I had is I had a staff, a limited staff at the law school that was really burning out talking to these parents because these parents have a lot of needs and they have a lot, they haven't been able to have, you know, any time to talk to anybody and get through this. And so the staff was burning out and I also had a problem where the students were not as engaged in the cases as I liked. We got a case management system, which was complicated, not for my students because they love the technology. We were using Clio and we were trying to figure out how to do all of this in Clio and more connect easier to our 
um, mediators, our special ed mediators, and, and my staff person was a little overwhelmed by the whole concept. And she would say, well, I wrote it down, and then I put it in the file, and then I made a note, and then I'm gonna upload it to Cleo. And I'm like, all you have to do is put it into Cleo. <laughs> um, and she's like, well, but I need all these records. And the student was like, okay, how do I do it? Okay, I've just done it. <laughs> you know, and so, but it got the students. So then the students are now frontlining with the parents. The students call the parents back. We do a lot of preemptive training on what special ed is, what the concerns might be. We have flow charts for if the parent asks for mediation versus if the parent asks for facilitation explaining to the parents what the differences are of those processes, who can be involved in that. Lawyers in Arkansas cannot go to mediation, which is something I've been working on and haven't been as successful at Jill at fixing, but they are allowed in facilitations. So parents will bring their lawyers to the facilitations if they want them or have them available by phone. Um, but the students are now more engaged with the parents. They're more engaged with the cases. They go to the cases and they have a bigger idea of what's going on in that case because they help to set it up. They write the agendas with the facilitators. Um, and they also have much better understanding of the case management system, which I've already had a couple of people say, this is great going to my law firm. I knew exactly what was going on. I knew how to put things in that some of the lawyers that have been there for a long time didn't because I'd worked on the case management system at the school. And so um, I, it's been a great program, it's helping. I want it to help more. We're doing more trainings this summer. We're going out and talking to more administrators. One of the things that I found in all of my mediation programs is that judges listen to judges, lawyers listen to lawyers, caseworkers listen to caseworkers. So I'm bringing principals with me that like this. I'm bringing administrators. I'm bringing the LEA, who's the local education advisor, to help talk to those populations. And I'm bringing parents that have loved this program to talk to other parents, to say, this helped me. I got on the same page as the teacher. They're able to express their appreciation for the teacher. You know, it's not just you didn't do this for my child, it's this works and this doesn't work. And one of the things, like other family cases, is we have children who have very different attitudes and experiences at school than they do at home when they have special needs. And some of that is because of the environment. It might be a better environment at home and a more controlled environment, or it might be better at school, but they have the parents and the teachers have very different experiences with the children. Sitting them down, getting them to talk about, talk about why that might be so has been really helpful in terms of planning for the students next school year and next school year. And how I know this is working, which I love, is that we're getting cases now in this month, which we haven't in the past, because they're planning. They're planning for August when they go back to school. And so they're already saying, up, we don't have a problem now, but we know we want to set this up in August. When can we meet? I want to get a date on the calendar. I want to meet with this person. So that's my program. Okay, well, thank you so much. I, so an obstacle I heard you say was um, this idea that when first presented with the idea of mediation, they didn't see it, like you said, as a tool, but as something else they have to do, like another meeting. And I think that this, is, this speaks both to what Lisa was saying earlier about scheduling constraints, making engagement hard, and also what you said about translation. It just came up again yesterday that um, how people understand what it is we do is it's not always in accordance with how we think it is, that how we think what we do is. Uh, now I can't even talk. Um, but uh, to be able to make that move from mediation to facilitation or to explain what mediation is or to be able to talk about all the different components of the agreement, I mean, this is, this is going to be a huge part of the overhead of any engagement, I think, is that... Um, translation piece. Yeah, and the other thing is that more contact that the students have had with the parents really, I think, gave them insight into future clients mm -hmm. who, you know, don't show up to meetings or who don't understand or who you have to explain several times. And so they've, they've liked that aspect of it, too. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay, Josh. <clears throat> I'm Josh Stolberg. Uh, privileged to be on the panel. I hope this is some contribution. Um, I want to describe for you a uh, a course we offer at uh, The Ohio State University <laughs> uh, uh, Law School. Uh, we, um, you heard yesterday from my colleague Sarah Cole describing <clears throat> what 80% of the law schools, uh, at least on their websites, report as uh, mediation clinics involving small claims court, community dispute resolution centers. We, we offer a course, uh, have uh, at, at Ohio State for a long time, called the Multi-Party Mediation Clinic. And to some extent, it was born. I've pulled this quote, so I won't screw it up. Uh, but Derek Bach, of course, is famous <clears throat> for a number of things. But uh, at least for some of us, the, um, the quote of, um, in uh, to his uh, 
Harvard overseers went, over the next generation, I predict society's greatest opportunities will lie in tapping the human inclinations toward collaboration and compromise rather than stirring proclivities for competition and rivalry. If lawyers are not leaders in marshalling cooperation and designing mechanisms that allow it to flourish, they will not be at the center of the most creative social experiments of our time. So our notion here in, in running a four credit hour mediation practicum, uh, multi-party mediation practicum, um, is to help sort of advance that, that dimension. Let me describe for you the kinds of engagements we, we look for. Uh, by contrast with, and I'm contrasting it now with clinics we've all taught in terms of um, non-represented small claims court, uh, landlord tenant, neighborhood dispute type cases. Uh, we look for, uh, in this clinic, we look for um, <clears throat> engagement in which the issues are not crystallized as legal causes of action, but uh, they're problems that people have, have to deal with. Uh, we look for entry before anyone's thought about filing a, a lawsuit, uh, or if a lawsuit is filed it's, um, by the parties, it's, it's typically for a slice of uh, the, the controversy, quote, not the whole thing. We look for uh, opportunities where diversity dynamics are central to uh, enlace the conversations. Uh, that's not difficult to find, but you know, racial, ethnic, uh, economic diversity is, is part of it. And then we look for uh, group stakeholders rather than individual participants. So the whole dynamic of uh, intervening in conflicts with where stakeholders themselves are multi-party and have different viewpoints is part of, if, is part of the experience. So what's the format of the engagement? Uh, by contrast uh, with other, uh, with interpersonal clinics, um, the professor takes the lead role in this. Um, Indeed, often the credibility for entry is tied to the confidence of the participants that a, quote, professional person uh, with some experience is going to lead it. And then we, work, we have three to four students partner with us. Uh, so we treat it like a, um, a mediation team going into, uh, going into a controversy. Obviously, if we have a class size of, you know, 12, 14 people, we need three or four projects uh, during, during the semester to make it work. Um, the, the team, uh, we make every effort to, um, in, a, in appropriate ways, uh, recruit students to class so that we are assured that we've got racial diversity and ethnic diversity uh, in, our, uh, in, our, in our classroom uh, in servicing the public uh, generational diversity, at, at least if I'm the lead professor, it's pretty easy to uh, uh, to uh, but uh, let me tell you, you know, I mean, and why is diversity important? The very the first time we, I, I did this at Ohio State, uh, our project was quite literally to assist the university develop the format for a new multicultural center at the university. Uh, one was dealing with LGBT groups, Native American groups, uh, African American uh, leadership group, Hispanic groups, and if you don't have diverse, you know, we don't ask people you want a diverse mediation team. It's our responsibility to make it, <clears throat> to make it happen. A um, Couple years ago, uh, on another matter, you may know that at The Ohio State University, we have a football team. Um, and uh, it, soon after, actually, the events occurred at University of Missouri, where that had given me my entry to law school, where you know that the football team went public uh, uh, over race matters, uh, threatened to not to play. We had a comparable dynamic happen uh, at, at Ohio State. It wasn't related to play. The, the season was over, but the football team was about to go public with something that would have uh, embarrassed the entire university in terms of its national reputation. Um, you know, you, one, one doesn't think about, do you, do you have a mediation team that is racially diverse? You just make it happen. Um, so that dynamic uh, in terms of the engagement is critical. And then, how do we get the case? Thank you. Uh, we affirmatively go after the case. We don't wait to get it teed up, um, we, which means we have to work to find it, to cultivate it, and try to time it to the, um, uh, to the semester, to semester framework. So let me tell you about the kind of a, an example of a case. Um, uh, at Ohio State, we've had the good fortune of having uh, Langdon Fellows, and two of them, Aaron Archer and Rishi Batra, are here. This was one that Rishi took a lead on. Uh, I hope I get this right. But basically the notion was this. Uh, we had a suburban high school that had a problem with the cell phone policy. 
uh, the policy was uh, you can't have your cell phone operating in a classroom. How does that get enforced? Teachers go around, and if people, if a teacher sees somebody, quote, using their phone, the policy required the teacher to grab the phone, take it at the end of class, turn it into the administrative office, and the kid could pick up the uh, cell phone at the end of the school day. Um, what was the problem with it? Teachers hated it uh, because they had some teachers who enforced it, others who didn't. So you had good teachers, bad teachers. You had people complaining. No, it wasn't really using it. There were credibility issues. Parents hated it. They couldn't leave a message for their kid. I'm going to be 20 minutes late. Pick it up. They, they didn't get it to the end of the day. Um, the um, student didn't like it um, for, uh, because they thought it was applied unevenly uh, and that they were being treated as uh, uh, toddlers and administrators saw morale crash uh, in the school among the staff and then we're facing the issue of those who didn't enforce the rule is that a disciplinary issue do you do you cite them for it and that brings in union contract uh, kinds of kinds of issues so there was a impetus and it was reported in the newspapers uh, and so we um, we approached the high school principal to see whether or not um, there was an interest on his part in trying to convene a conversation to um, um, to examine the cell phone policy. He, he was thrilled. He was looking for something. He talked to the superintendent. He said, if we create some kind of process involving conversations with stakeholders, could we label it a pilot project? Uh, and if it developed both process-wise and content-wise, something that the school district uniformly could use, you know, they were in a position to do so. If it was a pilot project that didn't work, just one bad pilot project. Um, so, um, so, so he agreed. So what did we do? We, uh, we, end, we had students basically, quote, meeting in caucus before a joint session to talk to teachers, uh, um, part, some union leaders, uh, other teachers who were interested in this, the parent PTA, uh, and the student council president. Series of individual meetings uh, where the notion was, would meeting be helpful? And the strong consensus was, yes, it would be helpful. Um, there's a slightly different obstacle, but this, the obstacle of going forward was twofold. Teachers were reluctant to have students participate. Um, they thought, you know, uh, if they said things prohibiting it, they wouldn't be well liked. It'd be, you know, their reputation would be instantly sent around on social media. So they were reluctant, and the administrators didn't want the students at all. Um, <laughs> so, um, and, and we persisted on that. Uh, we we want we press people to to talk about it. the student mediator. Um, uh, indicated to, in talking to the teachers, um, you know, wouldn't it be, uh, here's the opportunity for you to explain to a student um, how the use of a cell phone disrupts your planning, the dynamic of a, of a class. Um, persuade them, have an opportunity to take, a, to take a teaching moment to persuade the student as to why the use of the cell phone during class is disruptive to everyone's uh, process. They, they found that persuasive. The administrator, we talked to the administrators, uh, who were reluctant, and they kept comparing um, cell phone policy to drug use and gun use. Um, namely, one, you tell people what to do, you don't ask for input. And once people saw that you know, cell phones was, were different than drugs, uh, that and that student cooperation was quintessential to making something effective, uh, they bought in. And the mediation went forward, and uh, so that was one type of opportunity for students uh, in our practice. That's fascinating. So it's <laughs> so it sounds like there was a series of negotiations that had to happen that really paved the way for the project to even. That's exactly start. right. It's um, it's media. It's 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 building. It's, it's affirmative looking for opportunities to connect the process to problems. Right. OK, so thanks so much, panelists. And now we want to open it up. We're right we're on our schedule. Um, we'd love to hear any questions that you have for the panelists or any thoughts you have around what engagement you'd like to see uh, between the academy and the real world, what, what other forms are available. Yes, Hal. Uh, there are great case studies all for the really interesting. Uh, one of them was the possibility of what could be done My question for Josh, uh, you're getting treated by a, a multi-party uh, clinic, and I was wondering, I have two questions for you, Josh. 
One is what training to provide the students, what training to provide the students on multi party processes, and before they start getting involved in doing it. And second is what were you hoping would be the uh, learning points that they walk away with at the end of the term? Great, great question. The, the format of the clinic is semester run clinic. We conduct a you know, 16, we, can, we devote the first four class sessions to mediator skill building training. That includes an intensive two days over the weekend and then several, you know, another eight to 12 hours uh, to sort of clean, um, to give people uh, the, the mediation training. And then we build on the um, relationships the, the school has developed with the local court system so that we, we, shoehorn in students to to do two to three interpersonal mediation cases supervised by one of the faculty uh, persons uh, so that they have both the ex they have the experience of sitting in the mediator's chair and having responsibility for figuring out issues uh, generating movement uh, asking questions so the first four to six weeks of the class is focused on that and then these quote projects kick in and um, um, so when, you know, when we're meeting with a group, this is not the first mediation experience students have had. And the fact that there is somebody who's a more experienced mediator to, to some extent um, modeling the behavior or working collaboratively, uh, it, become, it becomes a team mediation. You know, we, we've run, um, we've had experiences where literally we'll conduct um, caucuses simultaneously, and you know, students know know, know what they're doing in, in running a caucus. I mean, by that time, you know, one has confidence, and so um, that's the groundwork we have. It feeds back into the um, uh, into the classroom discussions. It's all supported by various kinds of readings in class. It's a semester long class, and our goal. Well, let me speak personally. My goal is that people um, that students see that the application of this frame of reference and skill sets can connect, connect with multiple dynamics in, uh, of people's lives, our, our lives, and that the, the framework of this being a litigation based, if you don't settle it here, it's, you're gonna lose time and money in a courtroom. Just, it's a, it's, it's a different, different kind of experience. So that frankly, uh, some of you know at Ohio State with Grand Lum as the initial uh, director and now Becky Monroe, we run something called the, multi, uh, the Divide Community Project. Um, that people see those as things law-trained dispute resolution professionals um, should have on the radar screen and are capable of making a public contribution to helping address. So that's, that's my goal. That's great. Please. They worked some. They worked out a new policy. Yeah. So scheduling is really hard for us. Um, along the lines of what Lisa was saying, that um, we're scheduling for parent schedules. We're scheduling on teachers' calendars, administrators' calendars. Um, but that's where an online tool has been really helpful because we've had our mediators post when they're available, um, and then have the the parties at, try to schedule it as much as they can themselves. So let them know these are the three dates, these are the times, when can people be there? Um, and th that's something that technology has really been helpful with because otherwise it is a lot of phone calls and a lot of scheduling. Um, and the students, I've told them that I can't excuse them from any other classes, but they're always excused for mediation class for a mediation or a facilitation. Um, and I've worked with some of the I mean, right up front we say, save your absences, save, you're gonna need to do this. Um, and we send something to all of, we have a, a problem or a, an issue um, at uh, Little Rock, which is where we have a lot of students working and the balance between work and school is problematic and we're still working on that. But one of the things we do, every student that takes a clinic, um, I 
when I ran all of the clinics, we did a conflict letter, but part of that letter was to say, we have students that are involved in cases, we hope you will be as flexible as you can be with their schedule. So it comes from us asking the employers to be flexible, not the students having to say to their employer. Um, it's, it's just a reinforcement, and I think it helped with some of the students, because they said, oh yeah, they got the letter that said they might have to change the schedule up a little bit. I would just suggest working with whoever does the overall semester scheduling in your school, so the dean of students for us, to make sure that we had a two-hour block that didn't conflict with bar prep and all other obligations that the students had. Mine took 11 years, so scheduling wasn't an issue. <laughs> Although I will say we, uh, we did, um, uh, I was able to use students to help write the comment letters. They, ought, they drafted many of them with, with obviously with edits from supervisors, uh, but we had them going all year round. So we had clinic students over the summer uh, on either work study money or other funding and then um, clinic students during the regular academic year. With our client clinics, uh, the culture at Ohio State is simply understood. It's a professional responsibility, and if the court tells you to show up on a certain date and conflicts with class, uh, the, you miss your class, and the instructor whose class you miss sort of understands that. Um, and we treat this type of engagement, the scheduling challenges, in a comparable way. So the culture supports it, not, you know, not miss half a semester, but uh, people understand what the, what the obligations are. I have thought about it, and I just haven't had time to do it, Peter. Um, and one of the things I think is useful, we'd found some curricula out there, but I think the law students have really improved it and, and geared it well for this high school population. So I do think it would be useful if I could ever do that maybe after being you know, interim provost or something. Um, I've, uh, this conference is actually making me think about writing my case study or some version of it. Um, maybe publishing about the crap method, which maybe some law student would love to hear love about. To I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so I have ri I've written about the idea, but writing, I have also thought in the past about writing about the value of engaging with rulemaking in general and using students for that process. So um, the answer is yes, I've thought about it. And this conference is making me think harder about it. Yeah, and I agree with it. We've done some small papers for cadre, um, but we need to replicate it. It's not being done, as far as I know, in any other law school in the country, our program. And they are doing it through different programs, but special ed programming is different in every state. Sometimes it's internal to the state, and sometimes it's external. One of the things we have found is that people like that we don't work for the Department of Ed, um, and we make that clear. So that separation, I think, helps. And like Jill said, I should write about it. I will, I will say that um, just hearing the, fo the four of us speaking, everybody used it, it, either the word or a synonym, um, the, the word credibility. We all needed credibility to uh, achieve our projects and, and achieve success with our projects. And I think that's a theme that somehow I'm thinking about for, to answer Peter's question, um, it, may, it may have something to do with this. I don't know. It's such a helpful question. It, it highlights for me um, something I really like about the Divided Communities Project is the way they publish those case studies. And they're, you know, they're very easy to read, they're very easy to digest, they're very accessible. And something that stands in between the Law Academy and the real world is our writing. You know, even it, it's, it's not written in such a way that it easily translates, except for, you know, obviously in your case. Um, but if to the extent we could find different forms that we could be writing in or different ways we could be talking about what we do, I think that that would be uh, really helpful in this effort. I mean, right now you don't get rewarded for those kinds of writing and those don't count towards your tenure or your promotion, so it can be difficult. Um, but it seems like that would really be a great connecting piece. And I will just say, as somebody who has been at this almost 30 years, one of the great benefits of being in legal education and having tenure or a long-term contract is after a while you can write about whatever you believe is important. And that's a, you know, you can do a lot of good and have a lot of flexibility after tenure and promotion. Yeah. Yes. 
I think we have time for one more question. Yes, please. setting up a regional mediation center uh, back in 1991. Uh, Josh Stolberg, Lilu Love, Sharon Press, and others uh, were actually instrumental uh, in helping us get that going. And uh, there were many facets to it. We had law students doing peer mediation. We had community volunteers uh, working with us to really try to open up the justice system through this effort. Uh, and the administrative office of the courts uh, became involved. Um, I, I ended up writing a how-to law review article about that, and I threw in just about everything. Um, you know, the, um, how we went about researching different programs, um, the training program, the ethics, uh, and other rules that we developed uh, for the center, uh, it, with all of its flaws. Um, uh, I think our, I like to share uh, the information that we had. And um, so I was able to do that because I already had tenure. And, you know, but I remember saying uh, at the end of that article, I said, I feel I'm more proud of this uh, than anything uh, that I've ever done. I really feel like I've finally become a creative lawyer because I'm, I'm active in this. But the whole idea is really not only to, to do it, but as educators, we want to share it. So again, it's, um, it's wonderful to see all of these examples, and I'm sure there are many others uh, in the room, but um, this is part of our common heritage. Thanks again. And with that, thank you. Um, have a great rest of your day.